the place that people need to aim for is seven to nine hours of sleep routinely. Once you get below seven hours of sleep, we can measure impairments in both the brain and the body. One of the problems with a lack of sleep, and I think it's part of the sleep problem out in society, is that your subjective sense of how well you're doing when you don't get enough sleep is a miserable predictor of objectively how well you're doing with insufficient sleep. So it's probably the idea of, you know, a drunk driver at a bar, they've had a couple of pints, a couple of shots, they pick up their keys and they say, you know, I'm off to drive home. I'm, trust me, I'm fine, I'm fine. And your response is, I know that you think you're fine to drive, but objectively, I promise you, you're not. It's the same way with a lack of sleep. We don't know we're sleep deprived when we're sleep deprived, but sleep loss and mortality, that data is very strong from epidemiological studies now of millions of people. There is that simple truth. The shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Short sleep does predict all cause mortality. The other thing though comes back to lifespan versus health span. You know, we often hear that old mantra, you know, you can sleep when you're dead. Well, I'm being very serious. It's mortally unwise advice because if you adopt that mindset, not only will you be both dead sooner, but the quality of that now shorter life will be significantly worse. And this is what we're coming to in medicine right now. We've done a fairly decent job of extending lifespan, but what we've done a very bad job of is extending health span. So people are living longer, but they're living longer sicker. And one way that equation can be solved and you can extend health span, not just lifespan, is by putting sleep in there as part of the health equation, which is completely missing in medicine right now. Here's another place where sleep is absent as a voice. And sleep should be part of treatment in several conditions, but more so sleep should be preventative. It's much easier to do away with disease when you take a prevention standpoint, then you wait until the disease happens and then you try to treat it. So sleep is probably one of the most universally available healthcare insurance policies you could ever wish for. Sleep is the Swiss army knife of health. If you've got an ailment, it's more than likely that sleep has a tool within its box that can help you out. I do think we are with sleep where we were with smoking 50 years ago in the sense that all of the data was there. We have all of the science to show that it is just like smoking. It's carcinogenic, but it's much more sort of problematic than smoking, you know, and it's not just linked to heart disease. Insufficient sleep is linked to Alzheimer's disease, you know, to diabetes, to depression, suicidality, anxiety, all of these things, everything that's killing us in the developed world has a significant link to, if not causal link to a lack of sleep. Sleep has an image problem. We stigmatize getting sufficient sleep with this label of laziness. We are slothful if we're getting sufficient sleep. And I choose my word very carefully, sufficient. I'm not talking about sort of excess. And so I don't think that has helped. I think communities, even in schools, were resistant. And to me, what I find surprising about that mentality is that we don't always hold that notion what I mean is that no one would look at an infant sleeping during the day and say, well, psh, what a lazy baby. We don't say that because we know that sleep at that time of life is non-negotiable. It's absolutely essential. But then somewhere between infancy and now, if you look, even toddler age or childhood, not only do we abandon the notion that sleep is essential, but we actually chastise people for getting enough and people become proud to tell you how little sleep that they get. So I think part of it is because we don't have an educational system that is either aware of sleep or teaching sleep, or perhaps I fear embracing and ready to, you know, celebrate sleep rather than stigmatize it. If you take a step back and you think about this thing called sleep, so when we're asleep, we're not finding a mate, we're not reproducing, we're not socially interacting, we're not gathering food, and worst of all, we're vulnerable to predation. Now, on any one of those grounds, sleep should have been strongly selected against in the course of evolution. Add them up as a collective, what on earth? You know, if sleep doesn't serve an absolutely vital function, it is the biggest mistake the evolutionary process has ever made. And now we're realizing that Mother Nature did not make a spectacular blunder that sleep just services every single system within the body. And the changes in the mind and the changes in the brain that happen that we've been revealing are stunning. And I've sometimes 
said that if you look at the data, wakefulness is low level brain damage. And it's very clear that that's the case. And sleep provides a repairing and a cleansing of that. We are a dark deprived society in this modern era and we need darkness to allow the release of a hormone called melatonin to help time our healthy sleep. But in modernity right now, you know, we come out of the day into our homes or we stay in offices and our brain is still being told it's daytime, it's light because of artificial light. And it's Edison that in some ways that we have to, you know, thank because it was his light company that popularized the, he was the first person that took control of the night and for the first time we dictated when it was light and dark not the rotational mass of the planet around the sun that was transformational in some good ways but also for our sleep it was a devastating blow your brain and body need to drop their core temperature by about one degree celsius or about two two to three degrees fahrenheit to initiate sleep and it's the reason that you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. Because at least the cold room is taking you in the right thermal direction that your body wants to naturally go to get good sleep. You could then kind of get recursive and say, okay, that's good, so your body needs to drop, but why does it need to drop its temperature? We're that way because we are diurnal species and we were designed to be sleeping at night. And our bodies latched on to the natural drop in temperature as a cue and a trigger to fall asleep. And in modernity, we have dislocated ourselves with constant ambient temperature. So we evolved to be told to go to sleep using this thermal cue. Together with light is the other thing. For a long time, we thought it was just light that regulated our sleep. It's not, it's light and it's temperature those two things. And if anything, it may be temperature that's even more powerful. So hot showers or hot baths, great, because you come out, your core body temperature drops. You get into a hot bath and you think, well, it's because it makes me nice and relaxed or I get warm and toasty. Relaxed, yes, but toasty, it's the opposite. What happens is that all of the blood will rush to the surface of your skin away from the core of your body which then takes the heat out from the core and you get out of the bath and you get this massive dissipation of heat. It's sort of all of the blood is just brought to these massive radiators that are the vascular surfaces of your hands, your face and your feet. They radiate most of the heat out and therefore the core of your body, the temperature plummets and that's why you fall asleep faster. Regularity is key as well. I think if there's a single piece of advice, go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. Alcohol is probably one of the most both misunderstood and most sort of abused sleep aids. And it obviously is not an aid at all. It's actually remarkably detrimental to sleep. You mistake sedation for sleep. Alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedatives. And, and sedation isn't sleep. It's very different. Now, when you drink heavily and you sort of, you know, you fall asleep. I'm not going to argue that you're awake, you're clearly not awake, but to say that you've gone into naturalistic sleep is an equal falsehood. You simply have sedated your cortex. The other two problems with alcohol, it firstly will fragment your sleep. So you will wake up many more times throughout the night. So you sort of, if I were to show you your sleep graph with alcohol, it's just sort of peppered, littered with these awakenings. And a lot of those awakenings you're not aware of there may be just sort of two or three seconds and then your brain tries to go back in and reclaim its cycle and then you're back up again. So you don't commit them to memory. So you wake up the next day and you feel lousy, but you don't remember anything bad about your sleep. You don't remember waking up. So you don't think it was the alcohol. You just think, I don't know why I don't feel good, but I'm having a bad day. That's the second problem with alcohol. The third one is that alcohol will actually block your dream sleep, what we call rapid eye movement sleep, which is essential for lots of different operations, including emotional and mental health. So alcohol should be avoided, you know, the notion of a nightcap even. I would love to embrace that and, and you know, deeply unpopular for saying it, but I'm just here to describe the science and the data that we know of, and then people can make an informed choice. But alcohol is not the sleep aid that people think, unfortunately. This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Reading books is great, but I've talked about this many times before. Many books are written very inefficiently and should be much, much shorter than they are. 
Not only that, sometimes you just don't have the time to read a whole book, or you might want to just go back and review the main ideas without reading the whole thing again. This is why I use and recommend Blinkist. It's a great app that takes information from the best books and condenses it to 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. For someone looking to learn, I really think this might be one of the best apps out there right now. I recommend starting with a summary for any book on the Fight Mediocrity Beginner's Reading List, or any of the books that are in my Blinkist library right now. If that sounds good, head over to Blinkist.com slash Fight Mediocrity or click the link in the description below. You can give it a try for 7 days completely free, and if you don't want to continue, you can cancel at any time. As a Fight Mediocrity viewer, you'll also get 25% off if you decide you want the full membership. Thanks for watching.